And so without further ado, you know, uh, Gabor, please come on up. Uh, when <laughs> Gabor, of course, is a renowned author, uh, mind-body physician, uh, spent years as an addiction doc in Vancouver. And yet when we met a few years ago, one of the things that he said right away was interesting. He said, you know what? Your work, this whole idea of dynamic mindfulness, trauma-informed practice, absolutely intersects with all of the areas of my interest for the last so many decades. Adversity in childhood, the implications for child and youth development, addiction, chronic disease, aging. He said, this absolutely is so beautiful. And so since then, he's been looking at ways to support us and comes all the way out from Vancouver to take part in, in our conference to be here with you today. Thank you, Gabor, and welcome. Thank you, Thank you. Let me just begin. So, uh, a bit of an anxiety this morning in that I have 45 minutes to speak to you and then 15 minutes, 15 minutes for questions. This is regarding material that I could give you three days on um, really easily. So my task now is to compress um, what I understand and what I see into relatively few words and then also give us a chance for interaction. And I just wonder if this couldn't be turned off here, this um, flashing thing here. It's just, thank you kindly. So, as BK says, I'm a medical doctor, I retired from clinical practice now uh, in Vancouver, British Columbia. I worked for tw 20 years in family practice. Uh, seven years, I was coordinator of the palliative care unit at Vancouver Hospital, looking after terminally ill people. And then for 12 years, I worked in Vancouver's downtown east side, which is, you know, and in palliative care, we looked after people dying with cancer, dying with ALS, dying with multiple sclerosis, whatever it was. And then I worked for 12 years in Vancouver's downtown east side, which is notorious as North America's most concentrated area of drug use. So in a few square block radius, there are thousands of people ingesting, inhaling, <coughs> injecting drugs of all kinds, and suffering HIV, hepatitis C, mental illness, and uh, multiple other afflictions. And what I found out over the years is that there's only one thing that's the heart of cancer, it's the heart of multiple sclerosis, ALS. I should also tell you that at age 53, I was diagnosed with ADHD, and I took stimulant medications for some years in treatment. So I became very interested in childhood developmental issues and brain development. And so, to go back, what I found out is that whether it was physical illness, such as the ones I mentioned, or any other physical illness, rheumatoid arthritis, anything else, or addiction, or mental illness of any kind, or the preponderance of childhood developmental disorders that are burgeoning in North America right now, with millions of children being on stimulant medications for ADHD, half a million kids in your country are on antipsychotic medications, not because they're psychotic, but because we don't know, when I say we, I mean doctors, teachers, parents, don't know how to regulate the child's behavior without medications. And it's an experiment because we have no idea what the long-term effects of antipsychotics will be on the developing brain of the child. I know that in Vancouver, they've had to establish a special clinic at Children's Hospital just to deal with the side effects of the um, antipsychotic medications, which include diabetes, weight gain, personality changes, skin changes, the whole thing. But this is what we're doing, and the approach always is uh, somebody gets rheumatoid arthritis, well, what do we do about it? Well, we uh, give them steroid medications, or we give them immune suppressant medications, because in rheumatoid arthritis, the immune system attacks the body. So we want to suppress the immune system so it stops attacking the body of the host. Or <coughs> with ADHD, what do we do about it? Well, there's something going on in the brain. Let's change the chemistry of the brain by stimulant medications, which can make a helpful difference, actually. But 
our response to any, any of these issues, whether it's physical, mental illness, childhood developmental problems, behavior issues, is always reactive. It's always reactive, like we're reacting to manifestations. So there was a case somewhere in the States, not unusual, by the way, where, and this went viral just a few weeks ago, a kid somewhere in the States, eight or nine year old, or 10 year old, is in handcuffs. By the, the, is handcuffed by the school security officer. The same thing is happening up in Canada. We're just reacting to the behavior. And with due deference to BK, when he said, well, trauma, trauma, let's talk about solutions. That's not my approach at all. When I wrote my, I wrote my book on ADHD, which is the first book that I wrote, the Canadian title was Scattered Minds, and you look at the origins and healing of attention deficit disorder. The American subtitle, the Americans changed the title from Scattered Minds to Scattered, which is a, kind of an indication of something. Uh, <laughs> The publisher didn't think that the Americans would understand the word minds, I suppose. <laughs> only, only to have the same publisher publish a book on ADHD a few years later called Scattered Minds. Just to confuse things. But the subtitle is what's interesting, because my subtitle was A New Look at the Origins and Healing. The American subtitle, How ADD Originates So What You Can Do About It. <laughs> it's this sort of can-do Yankee self-helpism. You know? And I'm saying, for God's sake, let's just look at it first. Get present to it. Be aware of it. See how it arises. And then, out of that understanding, will come the solutions. As a Hungarian-born, like myself, American psychiatrist Thomas Hora said, when you get the what, then you know the how. And in North America, we're very addicted to the how, but not to the what. We don't really understand things. We don't look deeply enough. We just react to symptoms, behaviors, manifestations that are troublesome, that we don't like, that are pathological. And there's not a look at the source. So here's what I found out. That whether we're looking at mental illness, depression, anxiety, PTSD, ALS, cancer, rheumatoid arthritis, behavior problems, we're looking at one thing only, which is the impact of early childhood stress on the individual. And that stress happens in a social context. And so that the ideology of Western medicine, which separates the mind from the body, which doesn't understand that in rheumatoid arthritis, in ALS, there are physical manifestations of lifelong emotional patterns and early stresses that the disease itself is an outcome of, and that therefore if the individual could change their relationship to their emotions and how they function in the world and how they take on stress automatically, and what kind of relationships they're in, and what kind of work they're doing, and how they feel about themselves, that can actually significantly affect the course of the illness in a positive sense. In other words, if they get present to themselves. Many, many examples of that. But these are the things that my profession, despite a whole preponderance of evidence, absolutely ignores. It just doesn't compute. It's like the Mr. Spock on Star Trek. Emotions don't compute. And the medical mind, they don't. Um, <clears throat> similarly, let's look at just ADHD for a moment. So as I say, I was diagnosed with it in, um, and I, I don't have the time to tell you how, uh, how these early stresses translate into illness. That's, that's a whole other conversation. Except I can tell you that, let me give you a simple example. Let's say you have a two-year-old, and you're the parent of a two-year-old, and they get angry with you. Now, if, incidentally, if your two-year-old doesn't get angry with you, you're not doing your job. <laughs> because she can't have that second cookie before dinner. And why should she not be upset? I mean, when you want something, you don't get it, you get frustrated. Right? She gets frustrated, so ah! But what if you 
grew up in a home where your father, <coughs> excuse me, or mother was a rageaholic. And so that you're terrified of anger. You can't handle it. It brings up too much anxiety for you. So then you give the signal, overtly or covertly, that good little girls don't get angry. What the child gets is that little girls who get angry don't get loved. So then how does she adapt? She adapts by repressing her anger. That's the way she maintains the relationship with you. Because the fundamental dynamic in human life and the most important factor in, 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 in the development and existence of human beings is attachment, connection to another human being. As infants, we're utterly helpless, and we're more helpless than any other creature, and stay that way longer than any other creature. So without that attachment relationship, we simply don't function, can't live. It's actually, it's life essential. And throughout life, of course, we evolved as a species of attachment. By attachment meaning it's a gravitational force that pulls two bodies together, just like, you can, you, can really, you can really say that love makes the world go round, because love is the common word for attachment, connection, where somebody's taking care of somebody else, somebody's holding somebody else, and somebody's being held. Now, gravitation itself is an attachment force. I'm talking about physical gravitation. It, it, it pulls two bodies together. And literally, it's gravitation that makes the world go around the sun, isn't it? <coughs> so when they say love makes the world go around, it's true in the pure, purest physical sense. Well, it's also true in the psychological realm. So when the love, and by love here, I don't mean the emotion that a parent feels towards the child, because I take it for granted that all parents love their kids, and even the hard as it is to fathom, but even the parents who abuse their kids, love their kids, they just don't know how else to love them because they're acting out their own childhood programming. So by love here in this case, I don't mean the emotion. I mean the capacity to be present with and understand and see the other human being for exactly who they are and to accept them for who they are, and to invite them unconditionally to be in your presence exactly the way they are. That's what love actually is. And so I can tell you as a parent, I was completely incapable of giving that to my kids because I was still dealing with my own childhood stuff as an adult. Well, when children don't receive that unconditional, what Carl Rogers called the unconditional positive regard or the unconditional invitation to be in my presence exactly the way you are, then they have to adapt to that. Why do they have to adapt? Because they need the attachment relationship without which they can't survive. So without attachment, there's no survival. Therefore, be adapt. And if your child at age two gets the message that she's not invited to be in your presence when she's angry, then she won't be angry. Not that the anger won't be there, but she'll repress it. It's not a conscious uh, behavior. It's simply an automatic brain mechanism. Now, when you repress the anger, you know what happens in the long term? You're repressing your immune system. Lots of studies have shown that. And the immune system can then fail to function, or it can actually turn against you in the form of autoimmune illness. That's, in a nutshell, the source of a lot of physical illnesses. Not the only source, but it's a major contributing factor that's utterly ignored in, uh, in, in Western medicine, despite reams of evidence. And that's the subject of my book, When the Body Says No. But the first book I wrote, so what I'm saying here is that when there's a loss emotionally, that translates into biology. So it's not that there's biology here and no emotions here. It's that the emotions and the biology are completely inseparable. 
And what happens on the emotional plane inevitably will have its manifestations on a biological uh, plane. So what you lose emotionally translates into <coughs> biological events in your body. And that begins with brain development. Now I began, I began to be interested in brain development when I was diagnosed with ADHD. I was 53, I think, 54, 53. And um, it was a typical self-diagnosis. Somebody I knew told me, she's just been diagnosed, and she asked to have coffee with me. And five minutes into the conversation, I knew why it was with me that she asked to have coffee. <laughs> because everything she said about herself, the distractibility, the poor impulse control, um, inability to stay on task unless I was highly motivated, the hyper-focusing to the exclusion of other information when I was highly motivated, my addictive patterns, as I said in my book, my Jekyll and Hyde ways of being with my kids. All this, I thought, was explained. It certainly was reflected in the description of the ADD persona. Within a couple of months, two of my kids were diagnosed which seemed to go along with the mainstream medical view that what we've got here is a genetic disorder, which I never bought into for a minute. And why didn't I buy into it? Because although I didn't know anything about the brain or how it, how it developed, I knew something. The tuning out, the absent-mindedness that characterizes ADD is not a disease inherited or otherwise. What is tuning out? What is it, anybody? An adaptive response. Sorry? An adaptive response. It's an adaptive response to? Stress. To stress. So that if I were to stress you right now, but I mean though that is to be verbally abusive, emotionally insulting, domineering, you would go into a stress state. <clears throat> and um, how could you deal with it? Well, you could just walk out the door. Or you could stand up and say, you can't talk to me like that. I will not accept it. And if you couldn't walk out, <clears throat> nor did you have the strength to confront me, to fight back, if flight or fight wasn't available to you, there's still a third thing you could do. There are, what, 100, 200 people here in the room with you. You could ask for help. But what if you couldn't do any of those things? Then how would you handle the stress? Well, you wouldn't. Your brain would handle it by a number of defense mechanisms, the salient of which would be dissociation. You dissociate. All of a sudden, you're not here. Now you're not suffering as much. So it's simply a coping response is all it is. So that's what, that's what I knew. Now let me read you a quote from um, uh, an article in uh, the Journal of Pediatrics that was published um, in 2012. Um, and it's from the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. And uh, the article was entitled, An Integrated Scientific Framework uh, for Understanding Child Development. And here's what they say. Now, this article brings together a lot of the research on child development and stress. And here's the salient, a salient paragraph. They say, um, growing scientific evidence <coughs> excuse me, demonstrates that social and physical environments that threaten human development because of scarcity, stress, or instability can lead to short-term physiologic and psychological adjustments that are necessary for immediate survival and adaptation but which may come at a significant cost in long-term outcomes in learning, behavior, health, and longevity. In other words, the way we adapt to early stress helps us endure that difficult period in the life of the helpless child, but those same adaptations become sources of pathology, threaten your health, threaten the length, you know, your longevity even. So what's adaptive in one situation, what's meant to be a temporary state becomes a long-term trait. And when it goes from state to a trait, now it's a source of dysfunction and pathology. 
So that's what I intuited about, about the tuning out. But what I didn't know, and this is astonishing, it's not so much that I didn't know it. That wasn't so astonishing because it wasn't yet, when I went to medical school in the 1970s, this wasn't knowledge yet that was acknowledged and published and, and freely available. But what I'm about to tell you now, and some of you are probably aware of it already, is, is the, how the brain actually develops. And how the brain develops is an interaction with the environment. So that the brain is not genetically programmed. The potentials are genetically set, and the trajectory of development in terms of what circuits will develop when, that's set genetically. But how they will develop, how successfully they will unfold and connect and what systems in the brain will become to dominate, that's not genetically programmed. That depends on the interaction of that individual with the environment. So that the physiology of the brain, so, so when you do brain scans of mentally ill people, uh, with ADHD people, addicted people, you can, in the adult phase, you can see typical or at least frequently occurring brain patterns. And you say, aha, the problem is in the brain. Because here it is, it's an abnormal brain scan. And so the American Medi uh, Society of Addiction Medicine de defines addiction as a primary brain disease. Primary brain disease, it arises in the brain. And they say it's 50% at least genetically determined. Utter nonsense. It's not even 5% genetically determined when you actually look at the scientific evidence. Because what they don't get is that what they're looking at in terms of biology in these adult brain scans reflects the child's early experience. That the brain is actually shaped by early experience. So if you take a kid with ADHD and you give him uh, stimulant medications like Ritalin or Dexedrine or Adderall, such as I took for a few years, what we're trying to do is to elevate the level of a chemical in the brain called dopamine. Dopamine is essential for incentive and motivation. Dopamine, incidentally, is what all the stimulants give you. So guess what? Cocaine addicts, nicotine addicts, caffeine addicts, crystal meth addicts, many of them are looking for that hit of dopamine to make them feel more alive and present. It's a self-medication. Well, that's what we give to ADHD kids. Now, you take infant monkeys, and you measure their dopamine levels, and then you separate them from their mothers, you know what you find? Within a week, their dopamine levels fall way down. You isolate monkeys or rats, and the number of dopamine receptors diminish. You put people in isolation, their dopamine function diminishes. We make people crazy by putting them in isolation. We're actually messing with their brains, because the brain is responsive physiologically to the psychosocial environment uh, throughout the lifetime. The most so as children, but it's a fact throughout life. And so that to look on human beings as separate entities and then as illnesses, as the problems in a separate organ in the human body is scientifically absolute nonsense. And this is how medicine is practiced. And so we know, for example, that children whose parents are stressed are much more likely to have asthma. A study here in California. In polluted areas, of course, there's more asthma, but it's the children whose parents are most stressed who are most likely to get the asthma. In other words, the parents' emotions themselves program the lung physiology of the child, if you can get that. So that human beings are biopsycho, I won't go into the mechanisms of it, except to tell you that if, if you've been treated for asthma, you might know this, but the, the medications we give for asthma, you know what they are? Steroids and, and a copy of adrenaline. We treat asthma with stress hormones. To, to open a kid's lungs or an adult lungs, we give them adrenaline to open their airways and steroids to suppress the inflammation. Adrenaline and steroids are manufactured by our adrenal glands on top of our kidneys in response to stress. And what's happened to these kids is that they've been overstressed by the stress of their parents. Their stress mechanism has been exhausted. Now we have to give them extra stress hormones to keep their airways open. And by the way, Steroids, cortisol, is the commonest medication that we use in rheumatoid arthritis, colitis, multiple sclerosis, dermatitis, psoriasis, eczema, conditions of the lung. 
scleroderma, multiple sclerosis. We give people infusions or <clears throat> ingested cortisol, the stress hormone. Do you think we might pause for a moment and say, my gosh, is it possible that something's happened to the stress mechanism of these people? And is that possible, therefore, that what we're dealing with are the lifelong impacts of stress? the biology of loss, and that, that originates back to childhood? That's not a question that the medical profession asks itself. We just go ahead and, okay, here's the problem, here's the solution, because we're not looking. So, I'll read you short two sentences again from the same article from, um, from uh, the Harvard Center on the Developing Child. And uh, they talk about brain development. And I'm not going to go into the details of how this happens, but I'm just summing up for you. The architecture of the brain is constructed through an ongoing process that begins before birth, continues into adulthood, and establishes either a sturdy or a fragile foundation for all the health, learning, and behavior that follow. Second sentence. The interactions of genes and experiences literally shapes the circuitry of the developing brain and is critically influenced by, by what? The mutual responsiveness of adult-child relationships, particularly in the early childhood years. In other words, the most significant factor shaping the physiological development of the brain is the emotional relationship with the parenting environment and the necessary condition for optimal brain development, which is so rarely available in North America, are parents who are emotionally available, consistently available, non-stressed, non-depressed, and mutually responsive or attuned to the child. Now, anything that interferes with the capacity of the parent to offer those qualities to the child will have its impact on brain development. So if you look at my ADHD, it's really easy to understand. I was born in Budapest, Hungary in 1944. Jewish parents. This is um, Second World War. And um, when I'm two months old, the Nazis occupy Hungary. The genocide had already exterminated most Jews in Eastern Europe. No, it was Hungary's turn. The day after, uh, this is a story I tell commonly, but the, but the day after the Wehrmacht, the German army, marches into Budapest, my mother phones the pediatrician, and I'm two months old. And she says, would you please come and see Gabor, because he's crying all the time. And the pediatrician says, of course I'll come, but I'll tell you, all my Jewish babies are crying. No, what are you supposed to be going on? I mean, as infants, what do we know about Nazis, Hitler, genocide, Second World War? Nothing. What are we responding to? The stress of our mothers. And the stress of our mothers program our brains. At the University of Washington in Seattle, they did an EEG study of six-month-old infants whose mother had postpartum depression. And uh, comparing them to the, <coughs> excuse me, electroencephalograms of children's of six month old infants whose mothers were not depressed. And you could tell from the EG of the infant whose mother was depressed and whose wasn't. The mother's emotional states program the electrical circuitry of the child's brain. It's really that simple. Or the chemistry of it, like with the dopamine that I mentioned. So here's a quote from the California based spiritual teacher uh, and profound psychologist, A.H. Uh, Almas. He says, the child is very open and can feel the pain and suffering going on in its immediate environment. The child is aware of its own body and can also feel the tension, pain, sorry, tension, rigidity, and pain in the body of the mother or of anyone else he's with. If the mother is suffering, the baby suffers too. The pain never gets discharged. Now, what do you do as a two-month-old, and that was my first year of my life, when your mother is depressed, terrorized, 
in grief over the death of her parents in Auschwitz, the absence of her, of her husband in a forced labor camp. As a, two year, as a two month old, as a six month old, what do you do with that pain and stress? You tune it out. But when do you tune it out? When your brain is developing, when every second, there are periods in the first year of life, when every second in this space of time, millions of brain connections are being made. Guess what? That adaptation of tuning out becomes, goes from a temporary state to a trait. And so 52 years later, I'm finally diagnosed with ADHD. Why my kids? My kids grew up in Vancouver, no, um, no war. My kids weren't abused. Uh, there was no substance addiction. I wasn't an alcoholic or anything like that. I was a workaholic, physician. Why was I a workaholic physician? Because the message I got from the world very early on is I wasn't wanted. Not because my mother didn't want me, but for the child to feel wanted, the mother has to be happy. The mother has to be emotionally present. And children, when they don't get that, it's all about themselves. Children are truly narcissistic in that sense. It's not a pejorative, just a statement of reality. They, they think it's all about themselves. They think it's all about themselves. When you see a narcissistic personality like Donald Trump, <laughs> what you're seeing is a highly traumatized person yes. who still thinks it's all about him because he didn't get those needs met as a child. So he's still trying to get it, pay attention to me. So the personality that we de develop actually is an adaptation. Uh, I'll go into that in a moment, go back to my own kids. So, and then when I was a year old, my mother actually gave me to a total stranger in the street to save my life. Because she didn't know if she'd be alive the next day. And <clears throat> so I didn't see her for a month. <coughs> Deep sense of abandonment, not being wanted. Now, I don't recall that. I can't recall being handed to a stranger in the streets of Budapest because there's nothing to recall with. The brain's organ in the brain, the hippocampus that encodes recall memory is not developed then yet. It doesn't develop till later. But the emotional implicit memory of abandonment is deep in me so that when five weeks ago I arrived home from Vancouver, from Philadelphia, from a speaking engagement, I'm feeling really good about myself. I think I'm really centered and grounded, ha ha. And my wife does not pick me up at the airport or she texts me saying I'll be 15 minutes late. I go into a rage. What's that rage about? The woman whom I need is not here for me. That's an implicit memory. And we're governed by these implicit memories until we become aware, until we become conscious. Until I, until I can notice that anger rising up in me, aha, uh -huh, anger is rising, aha, uh -huh, what's that about? Like Thich Nhat Hanh talks about calming. First of all, you recognize that there's an emotion arising inside you, and then he says, you accept it. Right now, there's anger. And then you hold the anger, mindfully, like you'd hold a baby. And then, then you look, what is it actually all about? And then the insight comes, aha, this is old stuff. Okay, well then, nothing to be upset about, right? So the, the, the solution is mindfulness, but I'm laying out the problem for you, which is the implicit memories now with my children. And so, so since I wasn't wanted, I have to compensate. Now how do you compensate for not being wanted? By making yourself needed. They may not want me, but they're going to need me. So this is going to be on all the time. And I'm available for all my patients all the time, 24-7. And I'll never say no to taking on more patients, because that's another sign that I'm being wanted, right? Or needed. Where does that leave my kids? With the sense that they're not wanted, because daddy's not around. And mommy is so stressed, because daddy's not around. So they, they tune out. Now they're diagnosed with ADD. 
genetic disease, nonsense. Multi-generational trauma and stress being passed on as it affects brain development. And if you want to understand why we're we seeing a preponderance of childhood developmental disorders, like all these diagnoses, autism, 40-fold increase, childhood bipolar illness, so-called, depression, anxiety, ADHD, conduct disorders, oppositional defined disorder, which, by the way, if I have time to tell you, doesn't even exist. It's a figment of the imagination, oppositional defined disorder. Uh, but all these diagnoses, behavior problems, the school problems, the learning difficulties, you know what we're looking at? We're looking at the biology of loss as it's affecting the brains of our children, and then how we respond to it is with medications and behavior control. Instead of saying, what's going on here? Or what's going on here is that our children are acting out their lost attachment relationships. And so what else do they do? If they lose their attachment, if the adults are not available to them, the adults are not present, you know, when a duckling hatches from the egg, uh, he immediately imprints on the mother duck. <coughs> and imprinting is an attachment drive. So imprinting means that um, I'm going to follow you. You're going to be my mentor, my nurturer, my protector, my model. And it's by being with you that I'll survive. And it's by being with you that I'll learn how to be a duck. But we well know that but the attachment drive is absolutely biological. It's not negotiable. And if the creatures and entities that nature had intended would be there for your attachment needs are not there, you're still going to attach. But to two, to whoever's around. <coughs> so that little duckling, that little duckling will then attach to a moving mechanical toy or a horse, will imprint on them and follow them around. None of which are capable of bringing that, up, that duckling up to adulthood. Our children, guess what? When the adults are absent, and in your country particularly, with the barbaric attitude towards maternal leave, uh, where is, is it six weeks of unpaid leave or something? Well, that child needs to be with the mother for at least nine months, three years, actually. Or the father, some, some nurturing, mothering parent. Any wonder, then we put them in daycares, where the, where the daycare workers are not trained to understand attachment, because attachment is just not taught. It's not taught in medical school, it's not taught in educational faculties, it's not taught in faculties of training of, of, of child workers. It's all about mechanics, behavior, so on and so forth. Well, the most important thing is attachment. So what do children do? Well, they're programmed to attach, like the duckling. But the nurturing adults are not around. <coughs> and the adults who are around are not nurturing. They'll attach to other kids. So that's another book I wrote called Hold On To Your Kids. It's about how children become necessarily attached to other children. And now they become each other's models. because. Once you attach, you start to orient. So orientation, or getting a sense of direction, how to be, how to talk, how to walk, you get that from the people that you attach to. In a culture, incidentally, like a tribal culture, Darcy Narvez at Notre Dame has done studies on the optimal parenting environment, and she thought it to be the hunter-gatherer tribe, because multiplicity of adult attachments, not just mom or dad, uncles, aunts, elders, grandparents, cousins. The whole tribe is a parent to the child. And children are never put down. There's none of this nonsense of, of putting a kid down at night and letting him cry it out so he goes back to sleep. What barbaric custom that is. Taught by doctors, sleep specialists. For God's sakes, what we're teaching parents is to ignore their kids' need for attachment. What, what message is the kid getting? that the world doesn't give a damn. Sure, he'll go back to sleep. You know why he goes back to sleep? To get away from the pain. And you've imprinted in his brain that the world doesn't care. And the Buddha said 
that with our minds we create the world. What he didn't say was that that's modern psychology, that before with our minds we create the world, the world creates our minds. So when we have a mind in which we're ignored, in which we're not present with, we won't be present to ourselves, we'll ignore our own needs, or we'll try and get through adaptations by suppressing our anger or being super nice, or if we didn't get the attention needed, then we want to attract attention, so we become super consumed with how we look, hence the 15 or $30 billion cosmetic surgery industry in your country. These are just adaptations to loss. And uh, the personality that we develop is not who we are. It's largely an adaptation. Donald Trump is not his personality, but he thinks he is. He's totally identified with it. So, not a solution. So there's a clip I was going to play you. Uh, so this is the reality of our society. This is what's going on. This is what's happening. We have to get present to the fact that this is how it is. We really not wish it to be that way, but this is how it is. Any frustration or resentment that we have around it is our own resistance to reality. So we've got, to, we've got to be at peace with the fact that this is how it is. And then, what do we do? Well, there's a clip I was going to play you by the spiritual teacher Eckhart Tolle that I've just been watching. Um, but I, we couldn't make it work mechanically, but I'll try and paraphrase it for you. He said the schools are teaching mathematics, they're teaching science. <coughs> These are not the most important things. The most important thing a human being can learn is how to be a human being. Is how to be. How to be with what there is. So how to be, when emotions arise, how to be with those emotions. When thoughts arise, how to be with those thoughts and recognize that you're not your thoughts and you're not your emotions. Now, this is not something that you teach formally. And you don't, as, as he points out, you don't, talk to, you don't talk to kids about mindful awareness. It doesn't mean a thing to them. But you are mindful awareness. And you work on yourself. You create that space in your life so that when you're engaging with another human being, you can actually be with them exactly how they are and not have an agenda, not have resentment, not have resistance, not have anxiety, not be reactive. And when children are acting out, you really understand what acting out is about. See, acting out, when you talk about acting out, we often think of a kid who is obstreperous, defiant, aggressive, uncooperative. So he's acting out. He can't act out in my presence. What does the phrase acting out mean? We act something out when we don't have the words to say it in language. In a game of charades, you're not allowed to speak. What do you have to do? You have to act it out. If you landed in a country where nobody spoke your language and you had to convey that you wanted food, there's no words you could use. You have to go, <laughs> you have to act it out. Yes, kids are acting out all the time. Adults are acting out all the time. Addicts are acting out their trauma. In the downtown east side, they're soothing, they're, they're, they're numbing their pain. All addictions are about numbing pain. In the, where I worked in 12 years in the downtown east side, there was not a single female patient who had not been sexually abused as a child, not one. Hundreds of women I interviewed. All the men had been traumatized. If you do the research literature on, on addiction and trauma, huge correlation. I don't have to go into all the details, I don't have time. Uh, and without meaning to be shilling for my books, I just, I want you to read them. 
you know, I want you to read them because uh, they contain all the truth that I've been able to distill from my own experience and, and from the, my reading of the research literature. So my book on addiction is called In the Realm of Hungry Ghosts, Close Encounters with Addiction. And so it's an adaptation. It's another adaptation. The, the addiction is just another adaptation. Let me give you, I'm going to stop sp speaking a moment to take questions. Let me give you a quick definition of addiction. Any behavior that you find some temporary pleasure, enjoyment, or relief in, <coughs> and which you crave, but which in the long term has negative consequences. Any behavior. So notice I said nothing about drugs. There's this whole idea that addicts are drug. Uh, no, most addicts are not into drugs at all. Most addicts are into sex, or food, or shopping, or work, or en entertainment, or internet, or sports, or whatever it is. And, it, and, it, and, of course, there's nothing intrinsically bad about eating or about enjoying a sports game. But I'm talking about the addictive quality of it, or the addictive relationship to it. So addiction is not in the activity, it's in your relationship to the activity. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a question. By that definition of addiction, how many of you, and of course it can, it can include substances, right? By that, by that definition of addiction, how many of you would acknowledge that you've had some or another addictive behavior in your life, sometime or another? Well, hardly anybody. Okay, thank you. Great. Let me ask you this. Some of you, if you just raise your hand and tell me, not what was bad about it, because we already know. What was good about it? What did you like about it? What did it give you in the short term? Anybody? Sorry? Yes? No, no, that's a theoretical answer. <laughs> what did it give you that you liked? Energy. It gave you energy, okay. Thank you. What else? Relief? Relief. From? Pain. From pain, stress. Okay, what else? Power. Power. Okay, let's, we could go on, but look at this. Energy, power, relief from pain. Anything wrong with any of that? These are normal human aspirations, to be free of pain, to have power. I mean, power in one's own life, not necessarily over others. <coughs> and, uh, <coughs> and to be energized. The problem, the addiction wasn't your problem. Your problem was, why did you have lack of power in your life? Why did you lack energy? Why did you have so much stress or pain that you needed to numb yourself out? And why couldn't you? Why, haven't, why didn't you? This is not an accusation, it's just an inquiry. How, what happened in your life that you didn't learn how to handle stress in a, in a more present kind of way? That you had to escape from it, thereby creating more stress. In other words, the addiction is not the fundamental problem. It's actually a response, and it's another adaptation. Everything is an adaptation, that's what I'm saying. That's the biology of loss. And, of course, if you were stressed, or as many addicts were, directly traumatized as children, also your brain circuits of dopamine and endorphins and stress hormones, they're not developing properly, so that the medications or the drugs or the behaviors actually regulate your brain temporarily. It's all an adaptation. Which means that if we want to prevent these problems in kids, we've got to recognize these kids, what's going on in their lives. Those of us that are healers or educators, or in any way interacting with young kids, it's our own mindfulness and our capacity to be present with their problems without panic. Or if we have panic around it, we have to recognize it's our problems. It's not caused by the child. We have to open that space for them to exist in our presence unconditionally. And then, by whatever means is appropriate to the age of the child, we guide them towards learning how to be. Not how to do, but how to be. How to be with themselves in a way that's comfortable. Thank you. And I'll take questions for Gabor from the audience. Thank you very much. And um, I just want to say that this is a paradigm shift for me about ADHD. So I'm just, it's taking time to process what you said. But um, my son who has that diagnosis, I remember going on a walk with him to Tennessee Valley. 
and he saw a mouse being stung by a bumblebee, and he saw so many things that no one else could see. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes wondered that, that that label of ADHD in another environment was that maybe he was the scout of the tribe. And so that I, I had more the paradigm that it was genetic and that if he had lived in another time or another place, it might have been a yeah, good thing. That's a nice story. And it's comforting. But it's not helpful. Because he's not living in another time. Okay? So... I'll say a couple of things. First of all, um, if you consult your own sense of your own history when you were pregnant with that child and then he was small, I'm not going to ask you, but I'm just going to invite you to consider were there stresses that are active on you at the time that would have impacted him? that he would then find a tuning out an adaptation from. Do you understand what I'm asking? Yes. Okay. Now, I tell you what is genetic here. Not the ADD. The ADD is not genetic. The tuning out, what's genetic about tuning out? What's genetic about being late for everything? What's genetic about, what's genetic about the fact that several times a year I lose my electric toothbrush in some hotel room? There's no gene for losing your electric toothbrush in a hotel room. Okay? Well, genetic <clears throat> is sensitivity. Now, your child is highly sensitive. And since he notices things that other people won't. So these are the people who are the artists, they're the creators, they're the, they're the wise people. But ADD is a set of dysfunctions. The sensitivity can exist separately from the ADD in a proper environment, that sensitivity would just be a, an asset. But in an environment where there is stress or pain, that sensitivity becomes a liability. Uh, your name is Venus? Mind if I hit you? A li little bit? Can I just hit you a little okay. bit? Okay, thanks. Okay, how much did that hurt you? Not at all. Not at all. But if Venus' shoulder was bare, and she had a burn on, on the shoulder there, her nerve endings were close to the surface. In other words, she was thin-skinned. And if I tapped her with the same force, now what would you feel? It'd be more painful. Severe pain. So that the more sensitive the child, the less has to happen for that child to be in pain, and the less has to happen for that child then to adapt, or the brain to adapt defensive mechanisms. So you understand the distinction? Yes, and, thank you. And so that many of the people, <coughs> so when they look at, you know, we found the addiction gene, they never find it. There's no addiction gene, it's total nonsense. What there are, are genes for sensitivity. And the more sensitive, there's some people, you know, a lot of stuff can happen and, and they'll somehow get through it because they're genetically not so sensitive. But it's not the disease. The disease is, an, is, a, is a result of an adaptation. But the more sensitive you are, I mean, we know, for example, that people with the same gene, this is a study from New Zealand, people with the same gene can uh, be either less violent than the average person or more violent than the average person. The same gene. And the people that don't have the gene are sort of in the middle. Now, what do you think the gene is for? It's not for violence, is it? It's for sensitivity. The people with, who are less violent, they were brought up in nurturing homes. They're sensitive to that. So they become even more peaceful. And, you know, and the, but the people who are more violent, they were abused or, or, or stressed. So they become more violent. But the gene was not for violence. So it's utter nonsense. The whole genetic argument is, I mean, I could go on for a whole day about that, but it's, you know, there's so many things wrong with it. And they confuse. Uh, these genes for sensitivity with genes for certain diseases. Now, there are very few diseases, like muscular dystrophy, which runs in my family. My mother had it. If you got the gene, you get the disease. One of my brothers has the gene. He's got the disease. Huntington's chorea. These diseases are extraordinarily rare. And most diseases, genes play 
a potentiating role, but not a decisive role. Okay, yes? Hi, I'm a, a Oakland Unified School District teacher for 20 years, and uh, since you're talking about sensitivity, what's your feeling about solicits? Uh, with um, ADD children, which, you know, it's <coughs> what's the, what's my solicits, fine gold, um, certain foods or colorings that are um, created. Well, look, fair enough. Uh, see, when you look at ADD, it's a set of behavior symptoms, but it doesn't explain anything. It's just a description, right? And the same, the, the description could fit any number of um, causative dynamics. <coughs> so, lead poisoning or alcohol, excessive alcohol during pregnancy will give rise to behaviors that you could diagnose as ADHD. And these kids are highly sensitive. And there's a lot of junk in our environment, in the food that we eat, and so, as you say. And they're very sensitive. But we know how sensitive they are because they have a bit too much sugar, they go wild. And when they go hungry, uh, they're impossible. So they're very sensitive to their internal chemistry. However, if you ask me what the major factor is in the driving the preponderance of ADHD these days, it's still the stress that I would say, with other contributing factors. Very rarely, I think, will you find a kid where it's a purely physical uh, source at, 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 as the base of it. But it's possible. Yes? OK, well, wherever. There's a hand right here, close to you, and then we'll go over there, okay? Good morning, my name's Wendy and I work at, uh, as in academic support, what's called academic support at yeah. Oakland School for the Arts, and so we have a whole school of very sensitive kids. And, um, but my question, I just wanted to, um, I really appreciate your work and your books, and I wanted to ask about just what you touched on with your own history about the multi-generational impact mm -hmm. of injustice and oppression. Um, i am just become familiar with Joy DeGru's work um, around hey, post, work, her name's Joy DeGru, DeGru is that how you yeah. say it? Uh, Post-traumatic stress, <coughs> uh, slave syndrome, um, talking mm -hmm. about the consequences, on it, so, uh, historical impacts of slavery and genocide, and just in my perspective, I feel that some of this, uh, some of the healing has to do with uh, social activism and and uh, some of the solutions have to do with that, but that's just wanted to see if you could address that the causes of uh, stress through historical. Well, trauma. look, sure, so sure. So, so I, I talked about biopsychosocial, so that it happens in the the biology is affected by our psychological and social relationships. So, when I talked about asthma, for example. Uh, it's much worse amongst Puerto Rican kids in Chicago who are facing all kinds of cultural and economic challenges. Uh, Study has shown that. And of course, addiction, like in my country, but yours too, is rife amongst the uh, native Aboriginal population because of the historical trauma. And I, could, and I write about that in my book on addiction. And in, in a downtown east of Vancouver, 30% of my clients who are First Nations origin, they only are 5% of the population. The jails of Canada, 30% of the people are, are natives, 5%, 4% of the population. I mean, it's, and, and, and of course, you see the same thing in the States as well. Uh, so this is historical, this is social. <clears throat> Hence my next book <laughs> called uh, Toxic Culture. Toxic, Toxic Culture, uh, Illness and Healing in a materialistic world. And social activism can be healing in that it takes people out of isolation, it empowers them, gives them meaning, and um, regardless of the results, if you don't get too attached to the results, if you just engage in the importance of the work, it can be very liberating for the individual. With one caveat, which is that if I look at my own history of political activism on a number of issues, there's a whole bunch of issues on which I used to be infused with tremendous rage. So as a Jew, I've been terribly upset for decades about what's happening with the Palestinians and how we've literally 
traumatize the whole other people as, as a way of thinking that we can resolve our own trauma. That's really what's happened. But the outrage that I have and the hatred I'd have around it, how would that help me convince another fellow Jew of what's going on? So social activism can be a displacement for the personal growth that we're refusing to do. Because you know what? If you want to fight injustice, not hard to find it. All you have to do is go outside. You know? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's not just social activism, but mindful social activism. Without that mindfulness, without, that awareness, without taking responsibility. My rage has got nothing to do with the fact that over 2,000 civilians were massacred in Gaza last year. I could look at that fact, be outraged, but not, not in rage. And I could be committed to making a difference without hating people for it. Insofar as hatred arises in me, and rage arises in me, and a compulsion to change things, and a frustration when that doesn't work, that's my own stuff. And it'll undermine my activism. And it has been the, that's been the Achilles heel of so many activist movements and so many activists. Okay? There's a hand over there. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Alicia, and I work as a psychosocial occupational therapist. There are a bunch of us here from a nonprofit in um, San Francisco. And um, first, I just want to thank you for all the books you've written. They have informed so much of my um, approach and thinking and um, just view of our human condition. Thank you. Um, right now, we're looking at, a, at developing a program for uh, resilience and preventative care um, so that youth are, don't sort of hit the tipping point of developing a serious mental illness. And what you said about, um, you know, when youth are really young, what's most important for us is to develop our own mindfulness, our own capacity to hold space for youth and, and model those behaviors so that their, you know, neurological circuits develop um, nutritiously. Uh, but I'm wondering for explicit training in emotional regulation in mindfulness and developing like a lexicon for, you know, and teaching youth um, explicit emotional regulation yeah. skills if there is an optimal age or an optimal approach, um, you know, that combines things like mindfulness and, and yoga and um, as OTs, the relevance to um, function and activity and fulfillment through activities. Yeah, um, well, so thanks for the question. <coughs> um, <coughs> Before I answer it, let me say a quick things about resilience, which you mentioned. We always think of resilience as a, some an internal capacity of the individual. Really, the resilience is another social factor. That, that resilience in children reflects their relationship with the adult world. So in, in um, promoting resilience, it's still our relationship with the kids that's the most important. Now, in, having established a positive relationship where the child feels safe, then are there explicit methods? I would be straying beyond my expertise if I answered that question, except to say that um, it, it can take many forms, and it should rarely be purely didactic. Um, with younger children, you do it through play. You do it through movement. In fact, at any age, you do it through movement, whether it's yoga or dance or whatever it is. Uh, creative expression, and then reflecting on what they've created, like art, painting, drawing. Um, and then as they get older, uh, intellectual and verbal skills come online, then you can start actually talking about concepts, such as awareness and, and, and uh, noticing your thoughts, <coughs> noticing your emotions. Um, but I really do think that the people on the ground in, in the schools like yourself, you're in a much better position to uh, develop the techniques than I would be, um, so long as you're aware that there's many ways to do it. And, and it always has to be age appropriate. 
Okay. It's the best I can tell you.